All right, let's do this all over again. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to Heroes Never Die, your one-stop spot for all things Overwatch. I'm your host, Somebody Drug, and tonight on episode 236, we'll be taking a look at all the latest news around Overwatch, as well as its competitive scene. So before we get into the news and introduce you to my co-host, let me just quickly take a moment to thank everyone who is joining us today on Twitch for our live show, and of course, thank all of our repeat listeners out there. So joining me tonight, as always, is my co-host, Editor and Ed. You know, we just had the start of the Overwatch League opening a week mm -hmm. has come and gone. A lot of interesting things happening there. Scrimbucks both delivering and falling flat on their face. Uh, some changes in regards to uh, roles in general that we weren't really expecting. People returning to Brig Jail. You have uh, Chundu Hunters off to a really good start. 3-0 uh, yes. in the Shanghai Dragons. There, there's a whole lot happening, but beneath all of that, you know, we also have an experimental card that dropped on live servers uh, that is up to play. And then we kind of had a bombshell of an announcement yesterday mm -hmm. uh, that is definitely something i i don't want to say like it's a huge red flag moment but just the community outpouring these past 24 hours uh has definitely been a sight to see and we'll get into that here in just a few minutes but how has the week been treating you uh it's been pretty good you know uh, i've been playing a decent amount of overwatch obviously watching overwatch league uh and, and stuff like that it, it's been fun to get like into overwatch again with the overwatch league back like you know we've obviously always been interested in overwatch but when the league is back you you have kind of like a renewed interest so it's it's been fun i've enjoyed it right on well let's uh let's jump right in then so you know recently we did have an experimental card drop that was back on april 15th uh and we do have some balance updates Along with this, uh, you know, I, I love how I pull up the patch notes and I'm on the U.S. version, yet I still see uh, Korean in the date. That's besides the point, but let me get into uh, the patch notes here. So looking at Baptiste, uh, we got some changes to his Biotic Launcher, specifically when it comes to his secondary fire. So the healing projectile explosion has been reduced from 60, now down to 50 health. And then the direct impact healing projectile is now restoring an additional 20 health. Now, the other change we have is to the immortality field that now protects teammates to a minimum health threshold of 10% max health, down from 20%. I'm trying to remember, like, if that was the exact one that they had in that tournament not so yeah. long ago. Yeah, I can't remember what all those changes were uh, with the with the tournament when they did the crazy changes. Um, but, you know, uh, Baptiste is definitely the healer that probably needed to be touched the most because Baptiste is super strong. But I like what they did here is they reduced the healing, you know, explosion, you know, uh, so it affects... It basically rewards you for being accurate. Right. Instead um, of relying on splash. Uh, yeah, exactly. Which at a higher end, you're you're not gonna feel it as much because of that. Um, like, you know, uh, the the violets of the world uh on Baptiste, this is actually gonna be a slight buff, I think, to some degree. Uh as far as their accuracy. Um, but at lower levels, Baptiste definitely gets weaker uh, because of this. And the immortality field is is just something where I I, I think yes, it it will change things. It's a matter of running Baptiste with the immortality field and maybe not having to run like a Lucio with it, so you can have more uh you know uh, more burst healing than a Lucio. Um. You know, maybe you run a Bap Anna or something like that, and it works out well. Um, but these are, I think, these are very good changes to Bap. 
Yeah, I'm enjoying it. Uh, moving on, we have a change to Diva, specifically to her call mech. Okay, so this is for the, uh, the baby Diva. So when you call your mech down, they increase the damage from 50, now at 250. Now, okay, I, I understand this is a huge damage buff. It's a meme buff. But, but the actuality of this coming into play, right, is very slim. Sure, you can uh, potentially one-shot people when you go back into your mech. But that's already like a razor thin line as Baby yep. Diva trying to mech in the first place. Because in most situations, you're better off just dying outright anyway. Yeah, you're not you're not calling a mech down like on top of the enemies. Like you, it's just not smart. <laughs> so it's it's one of those things where you know this is definitely a meme change. Uh, and, but it, it's also a change that makes sense. Like, yeah, you're calling down a giant mechanical, you know, beast, essentially. And, yeah, it should do more damage than 50. I, I basically, <laughs> the, the thing that this reminds me of, and, you know, because it is mech-based, you know, any time I put myself through the torture of watching a Transformer movie, <laughs> mm. uh, which was literally all of them, um, the amount of times, you know, they would have the, the robots, like, protecting the human, and they were, like, sliding down, and you see all, like, the glass breaking all around them, and there's a bunch of shrapnel everywhere, and, like, the humans are just completely unscathed, despite yes. the fact that, uh, there's shit literally all around them, and there's no way none of that would have gotten through to pierce them. Correct. That's basically yep. what the call mech was. It was like, it was a scrape, and not like something that would just Goomba stop someone, like in Mario, yeah, you know? <laughs> Exactly. Like, so, they made it more realistic. Let's just go with that. Right. <laughs> but definitely not something that's gonna come into play all that often in the kill feed, but, you know, when it happens... You know, you're going to be like, see, it was worth it. But it's not going to happen that often enough to really point out in this case. Uh, moving on, we have a change to Echo and Duplicate. Uh, so when Duplicate ends, Echo will return to the health value she had prior to activating the ability or to 100 health, whichever is higher. Uh, this is another one that was very similar to uh, the experimental card with the tournament as well, if not the exact same change. So it, it seems like... You know, they, they don't want to see a lot of these Echo players, you know, just pop in their their ultimate, you know, becoming a Winston Primal Raging all over the place, and you have to deal with Echo at full health again. So, you know, it just makes it a little easier to counterplay once the duplicate does end, where they're not always going to be at max health. Yeah, I, I mean, this is, Echo is very, uh, very strong right now. I don't think this takes away from her, um, it, her, it, I don't know, with, I, yeah, it's a her, but it's also a, a droid, I, whatever. Um, it, it doesn't take away from her viability. Like, it, yes, it's a nerf, but it's not a big enough nerf to make her not playable, so... Echo is still super strong. Right on. Next up, we have Moira in a cooldown reduction to her biotic orb going from 10 seconds now down to 8 seconds. All right, so, you know, obviously, like, Moira is kind of the healer that you and I tend to gravitate towards um, mm -hmm. for, for different reasons. Uh, you know, in, in most situations, anyone's going to look at this and be like, all right, that's more spamming I get to do. Uh, with the orb, so I, I want to see how this is going to correlate in regards to uh, the amount of juice that you have to actually heal. And see if there's like a more even split between damage and healing at this point. Yeah, yeah. It, I mean, I think this is a, a very strong change for Moira. Um, you know, being able to throw out more healing and more damage orbs is definitely a buff. Like, a pretty massive buff. Being able... Because here's the thing. Uh, I want to say the orb lasts for six seconds. Or right around there. So, basically, you have a two-second gap between when 
an orb ends and being able to throw out another orb. And so you can almost have like total like uptime on your orbs. So this is a, a pretty drastic change. I think this definitely puts Moira back into the the fold as as, as kind of like a main support. So I, I'm very interested to see how this change. Like this experimental patch is going to screw with the meta <laughs> pretty significantly. Right. Mainly the next two changes. Yeah, we'll uh we'll get there in a second. All right. Uh moving on. So next up we have Orissa. Uh they have a cooldown reduction to her halt ability going from eight to six seconds. And you know, this is one that always perplexes me because when you always talk about the unfun things to play against when it comes to Orissa, Halt is always at the top of that. So mm -hmm. to see them go back to this is very conflicting to me. Like, I don't think this is really going to change anything in regards to the overall pick rate for Orissa. I disagree. Um, I, I think it will increase the pick rate of Orissa mainly due to the fact of the next change. Um, like, a, a halt in... And I'm talking more for pro play. Mm -hmm. Like, higher-end play. I think having the halt on a six-second cooldown will change the gameplay as we see it because the next change to Reinhardt will make Reinhardt, I think, actually fairly bad. Um... At, at this point, so, like, you know, if you need a shield, Orissa now is your go-to, and having the increased halt change, or the decreased halt uh, charge time, or cooldown, will make Orissa that much better. Right. So, I, yeah, I, I think you kind of have to tie this in with the, the, the Reinhardt change. Yeah, I mean, that is true. Uh, so, looking at Reinhardt, we have a change to uh, his armor and health distribution. So, the armor has been reduced from 250 uh, to 200. So, the health and armor total has been dropped by 50 overall. So, his health is remaining the same. The armor is what is getting tweaked uh, through and through. So, you have 200 armor, 300 health. And, uh, you know, like, we, we've seen a ton of Brawl compositions right now in the current meta. A lot of uh, Ryan mm -hmm. Diva or Ryan Zarya. And, you know, this, I, I think out of all of them, this is probably going to be the most impactful in regards yes. to the meta. Yeah, I 100% I agree. Reducing the overall health slash armor of Reinhardt by 50 is very dramatic. Um, I would not be surprised if this is reduced to maybe uh, instead of 250 to 225 uh, when it goes live. But Reinhardt, if Reinhardt goes down to 500 total health armor, I, I think this, this basically takes him out of the meta. Uh, because you're making a tank that much more squishy. And anytime you make like the, the meta tank squishier not a word uh but uh, i'll go with it then it it really just screws with things um and this could this could lean to more Rissa, or this could lean more towards having you know winston divas mm -hmm. um kind of comps but yeah this is a pretty massive nerf to reinhardt right on uh, so, next up, we have a change to Roadhog with his scrap gun. Uh, and this is for both his primary fire as well as his secondary fire. Uh, they increase the damage per projectile going from 6, now up to 6.6. .6. And, you know, here's the thing with Roadhog. Roadhog is always kind of in a weird spot because he is always considered to be the, quote, damage tank. Where, in most situations, uh... You're really only seeing Roadhog in things like, um, you know, we'll say like Gibraltar definitely comes to mind. Looking for that opening hook to try to get a quick pick, and then they're switching off of Roadhog. Like, it's such mm -hmm. a, a niche pick right now in the current landscape of Overwatch, where I 
Like a little tweak to the damage isn't going to change no. anything. Nope. No, it won't. One hundred percent won't. Uh, you know, the only thing I think they can do to Roadhog to make him more viable is have a specific mechanic for Roadhog that would reduce the amount of ult charge the enemy gets off of him. Right. Like, by damaging him. I think that's the only change they could do to him right now that makes him super viable. Now, with that said, uh, the changes to Orisa could bring Roadhog in a little bit more to get the pulled pork combo with more halts and stuff like that. That's that's the only thing I could think of that that makes Roadhog semi viable uh in if this goes through. Yeah, is pulled pork. Like even going back to pulled pork when that was meta, there was still a ton of May play and May is fairly common right now as well. So Mm -hmm. I, I, but May is May is mainly used to combat BAP, a, yeah, in my for, opinion. For the amplification matrix. For amp matrix, like that is what May. And so if if you know, will will May still see play if BAP gets taken out of the meta? It's just these. I think these changes are different enough that we're really gonna see um, some unique combos coming out of this when it goes live so i kind of i actually kind of hope we get a pulled pork meta because that's that's always fun like pulled pork meta is always fun anytime roadhog sees plays i'm happy all right so we do have one more change and this one is to sombra uh, so this is looking at her stealth mechanic. So fate time when entering or exiting stealth was reduced from 0 0.75 seconds, now down to 0 0.45 seconds. Uh, then outside of that, we also have a movement speed bonus increase going from 50% to 60%. All right, so uh, a little bit more uh, sneaky. Yeah, sneaky, being, sneaky. Being, being able to uh, make up a little bit more ground there. And, you know, I know 10%. Like, just reading that doesn't really seem like a whole lot, but you'd be amazed at how much ground you're actually able to cover in uh, the same amount of span in, in that case. But, you know, Sombra is just one of those characters right now who is always going to be, like, the initiator because so much is getting based off of that opening hack or uh, initiating the dive through the EMP, so... Doesn't really change the play style or anything like that, but it at least gets a somber player to where they need to be. Or, like, if they can't find a target, at least they're able to make up a little bit more ground so they don't have as much downtime when they are stealth in this case. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, these are just, just kind of uh, quality of life changes for somber. I don't think, like, somber wasn't dominant, somber wasn't crap we we still have seen a decent amount of somber play and i think this is just you know it's uh, these changes will not make somber meta um but it will make her a little bit stronger where teams might consider her more uh i'm fine with these changes um you know again this will not affect people like me and you this is more of a high end change uh, than anything so you know it, it it is what it is. I I I don't. Yeah, like I said, I don't think uh, this makes Sombra meta. All right, so we got one more bit of general Overwatch news, and this is definitely uh, this is definitely one that uh, is not going to be fun to talk about for various reasons. But our Dev and Savior Papa Jeffy Cap Cap, praise, praise him. Then. Has parted ways with Blizzard Entertainment after 19 years with the company. All right, so what does this mean? It means that Aaron Keller is going to be taken over as Overwatch's new game director moving forward. Um, and, you know, obviously, you know, there was a tweet sent out by Overwatch. Um, all of the Overwatch League teams were kind of like restructuring their uh, Twitter handles or whatever the display name is, to include Jeff in it, and all of that. Uh, and, you know, this has been someone who has been the figurehead for mm -hmm. Overwatch 
since its inception. So this is a this is a massive deal because when you're talking about the person that's in front of the cameras, the person that is engaging with the community, whether it is through interviews, whether it is through developer updates, Papa Jeff was always that guy. And now we don't have that. So I, I know a lot of people are like, they, they always like to bring up the red flag of, all right, this is another major figure within Blizzard who is leaving due to the Activision overlords. And that has been something that has been driven home for years now. <laughs> like, this isn't anything new that people are trying to drum up or anything, but this is definitely a blow to Overwatch. And, you know, Kaplan was just always the person keeping us uh, in a better place, I, I would say. So it definitely hurts, but, you know, the Church of Kaplan is going to remain open one way or the other, uh, which is something that has carried through since the Cavalry days. But, you know, it's just, for me personally, like, how is Aaron Keller going to transition into that sort of role? Like, is he going to be as open or uh, upfront in regards to the community as Kaplan was in the past? Because, uh, you know, for, for a while now, obviously, you know, we've talked about the uh, the current stretch of uh, content or drought that is happening right now, and there has been quite a bit of radio silence, you know, basically for 15 months from Overwatch 2's initial leak uh, to when we actually got some news at BlizzCon Line, and now it's just kind of like back to square one in that regard. And, you know, I, I know they were talking about how we were expecting another update on the Overwatch 2 front in the spring, in like March or April, this was not what I was hoping to be hearing yeah. for that sort of announcement. So is it a blow? Absolutely. But I don't think it's like the major red flag that a lot of people are trying to uh, paint it to be because this, this stuff happens a lot. You don't have game developers sticking with a program from start to finish. Exactly. And I'm going to point out some other things at Blizzard. Uh, Ben, uh, God, what was his name for Hearthstone? Ben Brode. Ben Brode mm -hmm. was the 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 Kaplan of Hearthstone, and he left. Are is Hearthstone doing just fine? Yep. Metzen left World of Warcraft. Is Warcraft doing just fine? Yep. This is what happens. Will this affect the actual game? No, it will not affect the game at all will it affect fan sentiment yes and that's really all that that papa jeffrey cap cap leaving will do like the game is not going to get worse because kaplan has left it, it just won't one person who's just is essentially the face of overwatch leaving will not affect the actual game because let's be real Kaplan was not working on the 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 game. He he wasn't coding. He wasn't doing any of that stuff. Or he was kind of like the overseer of what those people were doing. Yes, he had input and stuff like that, but the entire game did not rest on Jeff Kaplan's shoulders. Um, it's just people assumed that because he was the face of the game. The the only thing that rested on Kaplan's shoulder was the annual Yule log. <laughs> mm -hmm. So it's it's one of those things that the game will not suffer because of this, but it sucks because he was such a likable person. That's the, the big issue. The game won't suffer because of this. But you lose a likable person. And and hopefully this Aaron is is a likable person as well. And his, you know, his updates are just as good. But it sucks he left, but it will not affect the game. That's basically what I'm getting at. Yeah, definitely uh, a ton of love being poured uh, towards Jeff Kaplan over on social media here. You know, I mean, ever since the news broke, really. Uh, and it's still kind of going on there. Uh, but, you know, 
now that we got that out of the way, let's let's talk about what's happening in the esports right now. Because obviously, a lot is going on with Overwatch League officially back in full swing. And you know, this past week we were talking about how we were going to be highlighting how the gladiators have been doing. All right, so here we are, Ed. You know, expectations from the community. Uh, I, I wouldn't say across the board, but a majority of the fan base was really high on the Gladiators going into the 2021 season. And here we are, you know, they start off and they had a date with the back-to-back -back champions of the San Francisco Shock. But their second match, being against the Dallas Fuel, uh, who had... Yeah, you know, we just got off the news of Xe having to step down due to some health mm -hmm. issues, and you know his status is uh, to be determined. Like he might come back this season if he's feeling better, he might not, but he's still under contract with the Dallas Fuel, and there were a lot of questions there in regards to how that could affect the Fuel, whether or not they would uh, bring in a hit scan player, or if one of Doha or Sparkle would pick up the hit scan, and all of that, but. You know, for us as fans, obviously the big question was, how is Muse going to do in the Overwatch League? Yep. And, you know, it was definitely a rough start. Now, that being said, like, you know, having to go up against Super in uh, a brawl, you know, type of composition is not the easiest way to start things out, right? Like, he's, that's... Super's bread and butter is a Reinhardt play. And obviously, you know, you, you also have Choyo been there as well. Uh, and, you know, we did see Smurf. And then, of course, on the other side, he was going up against the Element Mystic uh, former duo of Fearless and Hanbin, which is another highly touted tank line. Mm -hmm. So if we're talking throwing yourself in the deep end from a rookie perspective... I don't think there was any deeper water to start the season that you could come up with than what Muse had to deal with in week number one for the Gladiators. Uh, correct. Like, you know, obviously the Gladiators lost both their games. Okay. Not uh, not super surprising uh, because, you know, you played the Shock and the Fuel, which are two of the, the better, te two of the top five teams in the league. Okay, let's let's be real. Muse was the big issue. Uh, now Muse showed flashes of brilliance. Uh, he, he really did. Uh, but he also showed flashes of yeah, you're obviously a rookie. Um, and you're just not ready for this. And it will take time for him to to get past that. Um. I don't think Muse is a bad main tank. I think he's just kind of got overwhelmed mm -hmm. uh, so far because the rest of the team performed really well. Uh, I do have my thoughts on the Gladiators. I don't think Mirror should be a starter. Uh, I think you need to stick with Birdring and Kevster. Um, and hopefully you just get better once Kevster can actually come to the United States and perform on you know, US ping uh, <laughs> instead of EU ping. <laughs> well, I mean, even even with EU ping, Kevster was still popping off. Yeah, exactly. He was still really good. Uh, I also don't like the fact that you sat, they sat in Moth uh, as much as they did. Now, I get they pulled Moth to put in Skewed on Brig, but I, I just, I don't like the fact of not starting Moth. Uh, Shu played pretty well, uh, but he was very easily, uh, uh, like, uh, targeted by Fearless on the Winston. Um, and, and they just need to work on that. Like, the Gladiators, yes, they lost two games. I'm not giving up hope on them. They're still a top eight team, in my opinion. They just had a rough first week against two very good teams. Yeah, and it definitely puts him in a bad spot when it comes to contention for the main melee tournament. Mm -hmm. Now, that being said, you know, looking at their week two matches, um, easier stretch here. Uh, mm -hmm. They have the London Spitfire, which will be 
uh, I believe, on Friday. Uh, yep. Then they have the Boston Uprising for their second match of the week. So, you know, I'm not going to say this is a complete 180 in regards from, like, top to bottom because, you know, we were actually really enjoying what the Uprising have done in their offseason. So our perception of that team uh, is definitely changed from season to season at this point. And there's a lot of questions around London Spitfire in regards to how uh, that British Hurricane Corps is going to do in the Overwatch League. But, you know, like, if you if if you talk to people about Scrimbucks, you know, Boston has been doing fairly well. Uh, I, I think, as a whole, people are not expecting a whole lot from London. But, I, you know, I always find it interesting because, you know, we have the team synergy aspect uh, in, in different regards, where we have some teams... Uh, who are reuniting after, you know, a couple of years versus a team who is mostly stuck together for the past couple of years as well. So I want to see how polarizing, like, the Element Mystic core of the Dallas Fuel is compared to the Hurricane core of the London Spitfire. But, you know, I think this is a bounce-back week for the Gladiators. Um, I'm not concerned with Birdring, uh, primarily due to the fact that you know, I, I think the the perception of him as a player last year was really put to the test, and he, he definitely surpassed a lot of the expectations that was put on him, and he did play up. Uh, and, mm -hmm. you know, I, I expect to see more of the same, but I would agree with you on, on the mirror aspect. He did not look that great. Um, You know, we were expecting a bit more moth play, uh, but that wasn't the case because we did kind of see a split between, you know, the Beckett compositions versus the Brawl compositions. And, um, you know, part of that was, you know, in the Dallas game, it seemed like they were more pigeonholed into running a specific play style. Uh, but, you know, I, I do enjoy or get a good chuckle out of the whole Kevster meme when it comes to him not being pictured. Correct. <laughs> so there, there is that. So that's definitely something that's going to be a continuous thing. Uh, until Kevster gets an NA, and who knows? At that point, they might just keep doing it anyway. Yeah, it, uh, no. <laughs> I think once he gets to the U.S., they, they'll end that meme. Uh, I, I mean, I fully expect the Gladiators to go 2-0 this next week um, against the Spitfire and Boston. I think they're better teams than both of them. Um it's just, yeah, they need to they need to fix things. They need to not experiment as much. They're not the San Francisco shock. You can't experiment on every single map because you don't have the same talent that the shock do. So it'll be interesting to see what they do, but I'm excited. All right on. Well, let's move on to our reactions out of week one. So I sent out a tweet earlier. Uh, about the biggest over and under reactions of the week following opening weekend. Uh, this was posted in our Discord as well as Twitter. So I'm going to go through, I'm going to read these one by one, and I want to get your take on uh, on the replies here. All right, so the first one coming from Deathblow, uh, someone that should not be uh, an uncommon name for any Overwatch fan out there, formerly of High Nude Podcast. Uh, and Deathblow says, I'd like to nominate Houston for both under and over reactions. Thanks. All right. So Houston comes out of the gate. Uh, I'm not going to say looking like a million dollars, but it was definitely the rookie class stepping up so much farther than what we kind of anticipated from this team. Like, we, we expected a really good game between Houston and Dallas. Mm -hmm. And you had a lot of space being created for Happy. Happy had a lot of clutch moments, uh, especially on defense, uh, where he was just straining together kill after kill, even in fights where the Outlaws were outnumbered. Uh, you also had the first uh, collegiate uh, call-up, I guess would be the best way to put it, with Juby, who performed fairly well uh, on top of that. But Houston just comes out and looking pretty pretty damn good. So what, what are your thoughts on this team? Do you feel like Houston coming out, going 2-0 is uh, 
automatically propelling them to the top. Like, because Houston fans are kind of like all over the place right now. Like, they really want to believe this is the year. But then you also see a bit of experimentation going on as well. Because, you know, Jake can't escape Brigjail. Uh, he was back on it for some maps as well. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm buying into Houston at this point. Like I'm, I'm all like Houston proved to me that they are a top notch team. Their tank line is basically their saving grace. Mm -hmm. Um, and that's just was, was the unknown that occurred here. Like you didn't know how they were going to perform and they performed beyond expectations. Both of them did. And if they continue to perform this way, they're going to blow a lot of people out of the water. Are they the best team in Overwatch? Probably not. But are they top three, four? 100%. Um, so I'm buying into this. This is not an overreaction. And as you all know, this hurts me to say. <laughs> You should tell but, Ramsey used to cover his ears. Yes. <laughs> mm-hmm. Ugh. Uh, that hurt to say. <laughs> that really did. Yeah, but I could see it on the expression on your face. <laughs> it's just uh But they're a totally different team. So, you know, good for them. Good job, cool Matt. All right, let's uh let's move to the other side of the state. Uh, Spider, your co-host on the uh, definitive game rewind. I'm gonna keep plugging that anytime we can. Mm -hmm. Uh, went from hashtag burn blue question mark to hashtag burn blue exclamation point. All right, so Dallas, you know we we talked about Xe getting uh pulled a couple of days due to the health issues. The question marks around what their approach was going to be. I don't want to OW about the numbers. I was saying, you know, I really hope to see the Sombra Doomfist composition coming out because that was what that roster did to a T better than any other team in the world. And I, st I still think they can do that. If they go mm -hmm. that direction, not really. That's not to say they didn't play Doomfist or they didn't play Sombra. Uh, but, you know, we saw a couple of different iterations, but the, the big storyline was, okay, they lost their hit scan player, so this team is going to be one-dimensional. That was not the case, right? Like, we got to see Sparkle on the Tracer. Doha, at times, brought out Soldier 76, and you're like, wait a minute. Like, I thought this team was not supposed to have any hit scan players, and Sparkle definitely surprised people with his performance on Tracer. Uh, so all in all, like, they... Not not the greatest start results-wise. But Dallas did not look like a bad team, even if they were kind of hindered at times mm -hmm. by the compositions that they were running. Yeah, Dallas was... It, Dallas surprised the hell out of me. Um, with the compositions they were running and how effective they were running them. Uh, the the Sparkle on Tracer was definitely a pleasant surprise. Uh, the Soldier 76 was... Uh, hey, you, you, you did okay. But really, it was the Tracer. Now, the thing that I 100% I expect teams to start running more against them is the the pharaoh the gladiators did it a little uh and and they performed pretty well but if you just run pharaoh against this team i think you're gonna you're gonna see some some good production so it, it will be interesting to see what happens this week after teams saw what the dallas fuel were actually playing um but you know what they did better than i thought that's you know you know they beat the gladiators good for them they kept it real close against the outlaws good for them so yep 
Good job, Fuel. All right, next up uh, here, is, this one is from Plebes, who says, The biggest underreaction is Gladiators going 0-2. Uh, this is kind of a big deal. Uh, and then the biggest overreaction was that people being surprised by the Atlanta rain going 0-2. And he says that Atlanta isn't that good. All right, so Scrimbucks are high on Atlanta, right? And, you know, I, I know you and I definitely at times have had reservations about Hawk and Gator because mm -hmm. this is a team that we'd followed through ATL Academy. We were mostly following because of our boy Sugar Free. Uh, mm -hmm. But, you know, at the, time, at the time, they were the best NA team in contenders. And we were really high on them. And then I got the call up to the Overwatch League and found middle in success. Yes. Um, and in the current meta, the expectations were set a little bit higher, uh, because, you know, it just seemed like the heroes that they were really good at were more tailor fit for the brawl compositions, and we didn't really get to see that come to fruition based on the results that we did see. Uh, and, you know, the DPS rotation was kind of all over the place. Uh, I, I think Maza was honestly probably the best playmaker that they had outside of Kai. Because, uh, you know, Maza was definitely taking it to some of the DPS, even in 1v1 situations, going out of his way to pick people off, which is always great to see. So he had the, the aggro Lucia working in, in full force. But but what are you thinking here? Like, is the Gladiators going 0-2 not being the blown out of her force right now. Like, is that an underreaction because of just the community expectation for that team? Because a lot of people, ourselves included, kind of basically put them probably second in NA, if not top three. They, see, here's the thing. They lost. No, I, I don't agree with that statement. And just for the simple fact that the LA Gladiators lost to two of the top four teams right. in NA. You, you know, what's the difference between second, third, whatever we had them at NA and fourth in NA? Like, it's, to me, that that's not a big deal. This is a bigger week for the Gladiators, okay? So I'm not jumping on that bandwagon yet. I, I just can't. Um... Because it just, it, no, no. Uh, Atlanta, I was not that high on Atlanta going into the season. So them going 0-2, not a shocker to me. Just, uh, it's just, it's a, it's a mishmash team. Not that impressed with them. So. You know they're they're bottom ten team, and I, I you can't convince me otherwise. You know Atlanta's kind of still in that spot where this is a hyper aggressive team, but they don't always get control <laughs> of the series. Correct. Where a lot of times it just backfires on them. Uh, so like it, it seems like Atlanta at its core has this problem that has kind of just plagued them for a while now where they don't meet the uh, the expectations of them as a team where mm -hmm. they just they're punching down more times than not. Which is definitely hard to see where it's just continued season to season at this point. Hopefully they'll be able to turn things around on that front. But oh, man, Double Bubble was definitely a problem there. <laughs> yes, sure, it was. With them, as Fleeps has pointed out. So hopefully they'll be able to address that moving forward. Because uh, Double Bubble right now isn't going anywhere. No, not until <laughs> the new experimental changes go through. All right, so we got one more response. This one coming from Eco Point Overwatch, uh, who says that the overreaction has definitely been the shock is looking weaker. So are a lot of teams still trying to figure out the best system over the four tournaments. Lower seedings would just mean a harder fought run that always that's always good entertainment. Uh, and then their underrated response 
was Jake and Juby switching between Brig or Lucio. Make no mistake, this is a very strong backline. Uh, then he also pointed out Piggy and Jongu have had enough involvement in OWL tier scrims last year. Uh, and that the Shock should be very afraid when they rematch. Okay. I'm gonna do this right now. I, I think the the Shock looking weaker is, is a giant overreaction. Mm -hmm. They lost a match. We cannot call them weaker because they lost a match. Okay. And so, and, and as far as everything with the Houston Outlaws, I think we talked about this, is this is something where I think everyone was lower on the Outlaws and where they're actually at because you just didn't know what to do with the rookie tank line. Um, you know, and, and Jake and Juby and all that stuff, like, yeah, that's fine, you know, but Jake and Juby are not making this team. Happy's not making this team. Dante's not making this team. It's your two, it's, you know, it's your two rookie tanks that are making this team what it is right now. Um, so it it's it's one of those things where, you know, everyone underrated the outlaws, even outlaw fans underrated what the outlaws are. So I I, I you know, at this point, I think. The Outlaws are definitely one of those teams where they're much better now and people aren't going to sleep on them. But we cannot call the Shock weaker. Y you just can't. It's Again, they lost one, one match. They're still stacked. Yeah, and that's also a team who uh, had some interesting approaches. <laughs> Uh, over the weekend as well, because, you know, we did get to see Violet coming in to play McCree, which was really cool to see. Uh, yeah, uh, I just, I, just, uh, I'm not even going to get into that. <laughs> not even going to get into it. <laughs> yeah. Still uh, sorting out the DPS rotation, uh, but, you know, it, it was, it, I will say it was interesting to see Striker get a bench in order to play Violet and then bring in Twilight in at Flex Support. Uh, in that case, uh, but you know, Nero was kind of, kind of the mainstay DPS out of, uh, out of kind the of, Yeah, he was the mainstay DPS unless Violet switched to DPS. Then they brought in Glister. Mm -hmm. Um. So, but you know, we'll we'll see. In Krusty, we trust the. Yeah, we gotta uh, see where the dominoes fall because exactly this is they, team... like they're gonna make adjustments based on what happened this week. So maybe we don't see Violet on DPS anymore and stuff like that. Right. Because what happens when it doesn't work? Like, what is Violet's next move going to be? Mm -hmm. Like, what is this hero pull? We don't even really know in regards to DPS. Exactly. So, yeah. So we'll see what happens with the Shock, but they're still a top two, three team in NA. Right on. Like, regardless. All right, so looking ahead at week two, we got a couple of new teams that we'll get our first look at this season. Uh, so we have the Paris Eternal London Spitfire, New York Excelsior, Hanjo Spark, Boston Uprising, and the Washington Justice making their 2021 debuts. Um, okay, so this kind of teams that are all over the map in regards to mm -hmm. uh, power rankings. Out of these teams, I, I'm i pretty sure I already know the answer to this. But what team are you mostly looking forward to seeing play this weekend out of the ones that haven't played yet? Boston Uprising. Like, I want to know because, like, a lot of people are very high on the moves that this team made. Mm -hmm. I really want to know what the Uprising are going to look like. Uh, I could care less about Paris, uh, London, New York. The spark will be interesting to see, but they didn't change that drastically. And the justice we know are are just a good team. But uprising is is the team that, in my mind, could change from you know uh, one of the you know the bottom dwellers from last year to being a top 
eight team this year based on their changes. Uh, so I'm very interested to see what Boston does. Yeah, I kind of have similar thoughts to York because a lot of people aren't sold on the rookies that they brought in. And I I just want to know, like, is Ivy going to be the building stone? Like, are they building a team around him and Jonak? Or are they yeah. going to do, like, a combination of their four DPS? We just don't know in that case. Um, mm -hmm. But, like, the other, the other thing that I'm curious on is... What is Assassin's role going to be on the Washington Justice? Like, is he yep. going to see playtime over Jerry? Uh, because, you know, Jerry has always kind of had that inconsistency issue that a lot of hit scam players have. Uh, and knowing that we have seen quite a bit of Echo definitely leads me to believe that it will be Decay and Assassin starting for the Justice going into week two. But, you know, again, we haven't seen this team. We don't know what the split is going to look like or if there is going to be a split or if they just have two people in mind to start every single game. But I want to see what's happening there because, obviously, I still follow Runaway. That is still my go-to mm -hmm. team to follow in Contenders Korea. So anytime one of the kids gets called up, I want to see what they're going to do at the Overwatch League level. and. After seeing how the Justice performed in the playoffs this past season, obviously the expectations, uh, you know, ever since they got the K, basically went from Washington, all right, they're like 17 to 19, similar boat to Boston, uh, to mm -hmm. now suddenly being talked about, you know, top five, maybe top six in the Overwatch League. So can they match that same sort of success that they found at the end of last season? Uh, because... You know, regardless of the situations about the signing of Decay, I don't think we have necessarily seen that throttle of a team going from, like, 1 to 60 as fast as Washington did yes. in the postseason. So, like, right now, it's just like, okay, like, this team has added some firepower, like, out... I want to see how Bebe is going to do in a new team yes. environment moving over to the Justice as well. Like, there are so many things that I'm intrigued by with this team that it's just like, all right, I, I hope everything works out. Will I be surprised if people underperform? Probably not, because this is kind of like a Frankenstein team uh, going into 2021. But man, is my excitement up there for the Justice. Yeah, and like, you know, and... And and I'll appease plebs in chat. Uh, I'm very interested in to see what Assassin does, uh, as as well as you. Like Assassin, I think is the wild card on this team. Uh, that could really be a sick DPS duo with uh, Decay. Uh, but you know, Jerry is nothing else. I think for a, for our first few games, we're gonna get a, a combo of a Jerry and Assassin, depending on what map is out there. Uh, I'm also very interested to see what Bebe is, is gonna do, um, because you know he was he was pretty darn good on the Spark. So I'm I'm very interested to see, and he's got that. He's got the um, you know he he's tried and true he's tested in the overwatch league so it will be interesting but yeah it will be a good week in um good week in overwatch yeah definitely some interesting matches this week um i want to see if the chundu hunters can maintain the momentum after they went you know six map wins one map loss this past week mm -hmm. uh that, that's like another thing to keep an eye on because they do I'll continue their season the first up against uh, the New York Excelsior, and then they have the Philadelphia Fusion for their second match. So, not going to be an easy stretch there, but you no, know, the story kind of like going in was Chundu has a way of just 3 0 in the Shanghai Dragons early in the season, and it happened last season too. But it's just like, you know, every time we want to buy into the Hunters. They chun do it up, and then they just kind of like even out. <laughs> yeah, uh, it's just I, I'm I can't buy into Chen Du yet. Yet I need to see more from them. Uh, it's just I fool me once, shame on you. <laughs> fool me twice, shame on me. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, I think how it goes and, you know, the hunters just definitely need to prove more. Yeah, so all in all, you know, maybe not the highest caliber matches in week two. Um, Because week one definitely was more of the upper echelon. So, like, for me personally, like, my heaviest uh, investment uh, from just a team perspective is looking at uh, that Saturday match in the evening between the Washington Justice and the Dallas Fuel. Yeah, that's really (laughs) the only, like, hey, this is a must-watch game. Like, everything else is kind of like, So, but that is uh, going to be a big matchup. For sure. Maybe Chengdu versus the Fusion on Sunday, but I obviously will not be watching that live as it is at 5.30 in the morning. Um, So, <laughs> but that's really the only other game that probably could compete with it. So, it's definitely not as good of a, a week as last week. But, I mean, that's kind of what happens when you come out of the gate swinging. Yes, 100%. All right. Well, uh, that's basically it for the news this week. Mm-hmm. So uh, I think it's time we close things out for tonight because I know you got a busy night planned and I got stuff going on as well. So uh, let's close out the shop for tonight. Uh, so if you guys want to help us out, of course, the best thing to do is to head on over to iTunes and leave us a review. Uh, let us know if you dislike Ed's takes. Uh, that, that seems to be a common trend. Uh, All my takes are 100% <laughs> accurate. To each their own. I'm not going <laughs> to bite on that. Uh, but anyways, you know, we're always looking for feedback just because that will offer us insight on how we can make for a better listen experience for you guys. And if you have any segment ideas or anything you would like to see us incorporate, please reach out to us. We are open ears on that front. Uh, if you guys would like to support our podcast, uh, you can s- consider pledging to our Patreon page, where we do have tiers starting at just $1 a month, and you too can join the likes of our master and above patrons, Daniel, Owl, and Kesha, in helping our network grow. Of course, you can find all that information at patreon.com slash OWL network. Uh, and I do want to shout out to Leaves again, who has been uh, gifting subs over on our Twitch mm-hmm. as well. Always good to see uh the community, give it love to other community members. So I appreciate that. Uh, but Edinar, please let our listeners know how they can contact our show. All right. So you can reach us through email at hndoverwatch at gmail.com. Uh, we are on Twitter, and that's at, at hndoverwatch. Uh, we do have a website you can go to, and that's owrecall.com. Uh, we do put all our videos on YouTube at youtube.com slash Overwatch League Network. Uh, we do have a Discord where you can come chat with us over at discord.me slash show. And then we also stream live on Twitch at twitch.tv slash OWN show. We are a Twitch affiliate, so make sure you help support the show by subscribing to our channel and earn our network emoticon. Our podcast network does stream pretty regularly. So we have the Overwatch League Network, which is currently on a flex schedule, but typically records early afternoons. So make sure to check the OWN show Twitter for updates. On Tuesdays at 6 p.m. Pacific, we have OWL by the numbers, our fantasy Overwatch podcast, so make sure you check that out. And then Wednesdays, normally at 4 p.m. Pacific, bi-weekly, we have this show, Heroes Never Die. Uh, And the other weeks that we're not doing Heroes Never Die, we are recording Tavern Tales, which is a Hearthstone Battlegrounds podcast, Totem and I do, and that will be airing at 4 p.m. Pacific over at twitch.tv slash HS. Uh, you can follow me personally on Twitter, and that is at Ednar83. Uh, Totem, where can they find you at? Well, you can find me over on Twitter. That would be at totally Drunk. Uh, and, you know, if you guys want to hear Ed for a third time this week, yes. Uh, you know, be sure to go check out the, the newer show that him and uh, former Overwatch League Network co-host Spider have been doing, which is on YouTube, The Definitive the dip- Game Rewind. Where we are playing classic games, me for the first time, and we are rating them. I, classic? Yeah, okay, I'm going to air Portable, Minecraft, <laughs> Dark Souls 3. Oh, yeah. A lot of older yeah. games that uh, Ed hasn't had a chance to play. 
Correct. Uh, we have a list of about 30 games at this point. Absolutely. So go check that out. You can find a link to the first show on the Discord. On You know, they got Twitter set up for that as well. But for now, that is going to do it for us here tonight on Heroes Ever Die. I want to thank you guys again for joining us uh, on this episode, which has been episode 236. Man, we are getting up there, uh, but we will see you guys back in two weeks when, uh, you know, we talk more about the Overwatch League and we'll see. I'm I'm sure the experimental card will be patched through to live. By anyways, li by, live, by, by then, For yeah. sure. Uh, but you guys enjoy your week. Take care. Have a good night and we'll see you next time. Peace out.